Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the restoration. I'm your host, Stephen Peinecker, and I just want to let everybody know that I've extended out the uh, July book giveaway into August. Partly because I taped a bunch of episodes in July that didn't get it up in August, so for for it's extended. This month's book re, book drawing is a preparatory redemption reading Alma twelve through thirteen, and the reason I have it is my good friend Bridget Jack Jeffries wrote a paper in here called called and ordained a priesthood of all believers in Alma thirteen. She is an evangelical uh, graduate of Brigham Young University and is currently uh, getting her PhD at Trinity Evangelical Seminary just outside of my old. Uh, uh, old backyard uh, in Chicago. Uh, so in the description is my email. When you write me the email to enter the drawing, make sure you put in July, August book drawing in the subject heading and give me your name and address. So I'm very excited to have on today's guest. We had actually made an attempt to tape something a while back and we had a bad internet connection. So we had to we had to abort the mission, but we ended up uh, working that this works. I think this is going to work out even better I'm very excited about this guest I have on. His name is Jason Olson, and he's the author of the book, The Burning Book, a Jewish Mormon memoir, co-authored by James Goldberg. And remind me, I want to actually ask you about James in a little bit too, about the, sure. the uh, what he uh, how he participated in the writing of this book because it's a, it's your story, but you had a co-author, and he seems like yeah. an interesting dude as well. But Jason, welcome to the program. Thank you, Stephen. It's it's really a pleasure to be with you. So. Jason has a great story to tell, and it's so fascinating because I got I actually got to finish this book about 45 minutes before we started taping. So a lot of this is still fresh on my mind. And dude, I mean, you are you you were raised in a mixed faith marriage in that your yep. father was a Lutheran Lutheran. And you would say he kind of more identifies an evangelical today, I think you had mentioned before. Absolutely. And, and that your mother is was Jewish, and so you actually were raised Jewish uh in arizona so yep. and and so you you have that background but what makes it so interesting folks is that jason later in life would convert to mormonism and we're going to talk about that story because it is a very jewish mormon story uh, i'm surprised <laughs> how jewish it is even after you convert to, to mormonism but i also can kind of get the appeal that mormonism would have but before we get there i want you to kind of tell us a little bit about your background uh, of course, I just kind of set set it up there that you're born into a mixed faith family, and maybe just talk about your journey as a as really a, a very curious boy who took re religion and spirituality very very seriously um, in in your youth, and maybe just talk about your Jewish background, and then I want to talk about how Mormonism entered into the picture. Sure, thank you, Stephen. So, yeah, I was uh, raised in like a Reformed Jewish synagogue. Um, and explain what that is. So there's three main branches of Judaism, right? There's there's orthodoxy, which is uh, the most observant, uh, the most traditional in theology. Uh, there's conservative, which has embraced a, a, a more more modern perspective, um, and trying to you know trying to synthesize tradition with modernity, uh, with with a little bit more flexibility. Um, you know, more, you know, one marker is, you know, you're going to find a lot more female rabbis in conservative uh, movements, but they're still going to have some commitment to observance, um, some stronger commitment. And then reform, right? Uh, reform was kind of was developed in Germany and uh, it's kind of the enlightenment, fully embracing the enlightenment form of Judaism and uh, science um secularism uh and uh, not as a uh, traditional of a commitment to the torah and uh, as a as a literal text and a little bit more flexibility on observance um that perhaps some of these commandments are you know we're not obligated to to follow them in in uh, the modern world um, so that that was the branch I was raised in. Um, much more open to intermarriage, interfaith marriage, which is how you know my mother is uh, a Jew and my father's a Christian, and a rabbi married them because uh, you it's more possible in the reform movement. Um, and so I was raised in this movement, and so I definitely got uh, a sense of the social justice aspect of reform Judaism, which is, 
you know, is more committed to that kind of tradition than uh, observance, perhaps, right? You you kind of got this spectrum. So that was a big part of my upbringing that, you know, Judaism is about uh, social justice and, you know, doing what's right in your community, um, lifting the disadvantaged, the widow, the orphan, the stranger, the immigrant. Um, and so that was part of our uh, makeup, but we also had a, a very strong Zionist component. Um, Reform Judaism wasn't always so committed to Zionism. Uh, the, I think the Six Day War transformed that, and that's a whole other discussion. But um, Reform Jews, after that war, the, the movement became more committed and attached to Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel. Um, so we had a, yeah, my the head rabbi, you know, he eventually made Aliyah, he immigrated to Israel and and lives there permanently, has for like the last 20 years. And then the associate rabbi, a uh, female rabbi, of course, Reform Judaism was the first to open itself to female ordination. You know, she was married to an Israeli man uh, when I had my bar mitzvah. So it was like just, it was just natural part of our identity. Um, we, you know, we were more pro progressive, liberal, in our observance and our politics, but also very Zionist. Um, so that was kind of what I was immersed in. And I had a bar mitzvah, uh, which I, like you said, I took very seriously. <laughs> um, a lot of my friends were focused on the party, getting the party, getting the party right. I was focused on getting the ceremony right. <laughs> you know, I wanted to, to recite and chant from the Torah as perfectly as I could get the Hebrew right, get the, the tune right. Uh, you know, we had the, the cantillation and um, I wanted to get my sermon right. And so I, you know, I actually went over drafts with the cantor and the rabbi, and I wanted to make sure I was interpreting my Torah portion, Korach, the, you know, the story of Korach rebelling against Moses and getting swallowed into the, the earth. And I wanted to get that just right. And so I took the, you know, I took the ceremony very seriously and it definitely showed, you know, uh, you know, you're always at that age, you're trying to see who, you know, who could, who could become, uh, the next rabbi, right? <laughs> because, you know, who's into this, you know, every, you, you want all the youth to be committed to the Jewish covenant and the tradition, but you're trying, you know, the, the bar mitzvah, bat mitzvah time is when you could see who's, who's really into it and you could you know, hopefully send off to rabbinical school one day. So I was definitely in that mode because um, I just, just by default, just by actually taking it seriously. Well, and then you took it so seriously that, <clears throat> you know, a lot of your friends as they, they kind of do their bar mitzvah and as they grow older, they kind of grow, it's almost like, well, I've done my part. They can kind of grow, kind of move away from their faith and they're not as interested in studying the things that they were. You kept, you had this vociferous, vociferous appetite to continue to consume these things. And I want you to talk about, because you actually were a real uh, passionate seeker of Judaism and actually interacted, interacted with uh, uh, or Orthodox rabbis as well. Yeah. And and also, I want you to talk about your engagements with Orthodox rabbis, but I also want you to talk about a very unique story about a very <laughs> well-known rabbi that really made an impression on you in your youth as well. Yeah, thank you, Stephen. So, well, I had the bar mitzvah, right, 13 years old, and this is just a year later, 14 years old, and I I go to a public high school in Scottsdale, Arizona, but we have supplemental religious education. We call it Hebrew high school. And uh, it's just, you know, once or twice a week. You know, I think it was Wednesday nights. And I was actually very eager to go because I, the bar mitzvah actually excited me about Jewish learning. And I wanted, I, I, I wanted to go to Hebrew high school because I wanted to learn more. I wanted to become a master of Torah, right? And so... Uh, I, I even remember, this is just a funny side story, but um, all my my buddies our freshman year were like, they wanted to take uh, Jews Jews in Hollywood uh, or Jews in the media. And so the class was you just go and sit on a couch and you watch movies made by Jews or movies about Jews. And there's a lot. <laughs> and, and then you talk about it. And it gives you a chance to, you know, flirt with the girls and 
and have fun with your buddies. And so, I'm, and I was the weirdo and I signed up for great Jewish thinkers. <laughs> and, and there was only two students in the class, me and I, I think another girl. And, um, and I really wanted to go to the class. We had Maimonides and Rashi and, you know, Martin Buber and all these great Jewish thinkers. And I was really excited. But then my buddies were like, hey, you know, we miss you over here. And so I caved into the peer pressure and I I transferred from the great Jewish thinkers to the to the Jews in Hollywood class. But um, but anyway, that kind of tells you a lot about where I was at. And uh I made up for it though. I got, you know, I got a PhD in Jewish studies from Brandeis. So I made up for my, made up for that. But uh, I, so I went to, there was a Wednesday night special lecture and we had a, a guest speaker. He came in wearing a Jews for Jesus t-shirt, right? And um, he introduced himself as Mitch and he started, he got up on the Bema, the, the podium, and he started to preach about Jesus being the promised Jewish Messiah. And he went into Isaiah 53, the suffering servant dying for our sins. Um, you know, the only way, you know, I am the way, the truth and the life. And I was listening to him and he did a, you know, he did a, a quite preacher thing to do. He said, he kind of paused and he said, the Holy Spirit has just told me that three of you in the audience today have accepted Jesus as your savior in your heart. And I thought quietly to myself, am I one of the three? And be because I was listening to what he was saying, um, I, I wasn't believing in what he was saying, but when he said that, I thought, you know, is the very fact that I'm even questioning whether Jesus may be the Messiah, does that mean that I've, did I just accept him in my heart? I, you know, I mean, um, and my father is a Christian. So I, I was just wondering have it, what's, you know, um, what does this mean? And so I was really confused and I was, you know, I, I, I was worried that maybe I had just converted, but then I was, pushing back. And I was like, well, wait a minute. Why would the rabbis, did the rabbis convert? <laughs> you know, why are they inviting a Jews for Jesus missionary? And I was looking around and I saw my peers and I saw the rabbis and I saw a lot of anxiety and um, a little bit of anger, a little bit of, you know, uh, unease and Mitch left. And then we, so we asked the rabbis, uh, not me, but you know, some of the other kids, they said, you know, what, what are you doing? You know, what, why did you even invite this guy? And the rabbi said, Oh, you know, we should have explained more. We, we want you to hear both sides. So this was our guest speaker, but now we're going to have another speaker who's going to share you know, our point of view, we just, we want, you know, we want you to be able to make up your mind. So I think a lot of kids were pacified by that. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, you just, you want us to hear both sides. That's, it's a very Jewish thing to do. You got to hear both sides. So, <clears throat> but in walks the same guy and, but he's changed his apparel and he's wearing a kippah, a, a yarmulke, a skull cap. He's wearing a prayer shawl and he, his appearance is one of an Orthodox rabbi and he's, he's taken off the Jews for Jesus shirt altogether. And he reintroduces himself as Rabbi Tovia Singer, <laughs> the founder of outreach Judaism yep. and that he was merely role-playing a missionary, Mitch, his alter ego to show us, to literally show us, what it looks like and feels like to have a, a Jews for Jesus missionary try to convert you. And then he spent, you know, another 45 minutes debunking everything that he said is Mitch. And then going into, you know, Isaiah 53 is actually about Israel. And it's, it's not about 
the single Messiah. It's about the people. And, and I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense too. And, you know, and, and just emphasizing the prophecies that the Messiah is going, that the Messiah must fulfill. To I just want to point out to everybody, in case you don't know who Tovia Singer is, he's a very, very well-known rabbi. When I first read this story, I was like, oh my goodness. I remember even talking to you on the phone about it like six months ago when I first heard the story. Like, Tovia, I watched a ton of his stuff, especially when I was an atheist, because I was able to debunk all Christianity's claims, you know, uh, if I wanted to, uh, by listening to his program. So he's a very <laughs> influential person. Uh, he's kind of like a counter uh, a counter to the uh, messianic uh, messianic Jews or Christians, as they're called. And we'll talk a little bit about that later in your book as you encounter them. Sure. But but it was uh, just he's a very well-known person. So look up Tovia Singer, folks. Uh, he's all over YouTube and the Internet. So, yeah. So th so you hear his. OK, like, OK, let me explain to you Isaiah 53. Let me explain to you that everything that Mitch said is bunk. I'm going to I'm going to set you all straight. And that's kind of that must have been a real jarring experience for you. Oh, it was it was overwhelming in confusion because I I had just thought I was converted. But now I was like, oh, <laughs> wait, the he doesn't even believe what he just preached. Right. And then his Jewish arguments also made sense. Uh, you know, well, here's the here's the prophecies. Has Jesus fulfilled them? And then I. I mean, rationally, no. <laughs> so, but that was the moment in which I pulled back from religious authority. And I, I decided that I could not really trust the rabbis as I had before. And, you know, there's a lot of teenage, you know, teenage things going on. I'm 14. You know, it's a great, it's a great opportunity to rebel against authority a little bit right <laughs> and so i pull back and i decide i'm going to try to determine the truth for myself um i can do this right i can i had a bar mitzvah after all i know how to read scripture i've i have the tools i'm going to determine for myself whether or not jesus is the messiah and i had not made up my mind i just I just decided I would, I would uh, study, and and Tovia Rabbi Tovia Singer, you know, he encouraged us to study, right? I mean, how are you going to counter the missionaries unless you know your Bible, right? So <clears throat> I had a uh, a Tanakh art scroll, you know, art the Orthodox um, publisher, one of the main you know publishers of of Jewish texts, Jewish sacred texts that also has you know, really good English translations. And I had that Tanakh from my bar mitzvah from a year before that, you know, every, you always get that as a gift. And so I go to Tovia Singer's website and because this is before YouTube, so he's not on YouTube. He's just got his website where he's laid out the scriptures that you need to look up. And I start looking them up and I go to my, my Tanakh, my Hebrew Bible, and I start, you know, underlining and taking notes on the messianic prophecies only in the hebrew bible the old testament that's it i don't even own a new testament at this point and um and i start arming myself you know for a couple of weeks and then like any 14 year old i have enough confidence that i'm going to try out my counter missionary arguments on the missionaries and lo and behold, some of my close friends that I was eating lunch with every day were Latter-day Saints. <laughs> and if you know anybody that's going to go on a mission and become a missionary, it's the Latter-day Saints for sure. You know, you know, you're, you can be quite certain that they're going to become missionaries. So I decide, well, you know, if I'm going to strengthen the muscle, right, I'm, you know, I, I was always into going to the gym. You know, you need some resistance. You've got to put some weight on your muscles to get get them stronger. So I d I decide this is a great opportunity to to test my counter missionary skill set with these future Latter Day Saint missionaries. Um, and so we I start you know bringing in verses from the Hebrew Bible, and you know I show them, hey, look at this prophecy, Isaiah, you know Ezekiel, um, you know whatever, Zechariah. 
And, and I, you know, I would just challenge them. Hey, did Jesus fulfill this prophecy? They say, well, well, no, um, but he will. He will fulfill this prophecy. And I said, how? How? You know, we're, you know, it's 20, it's uh, 19, what are we, 1999. You know, he's had 2,000 years. What, what, why has he not fulfilled this prophecy yet? And he said, well, we believe in two comings of the Messiah. That he would come first as a lamb, and then he'll come a second time as a lion. So, Jason, what you're referring to is one of the lion prophecies. And I said, oh, I see how it is. <laughs> You know, but I had heard, you know, the term, the second coming of Jesus Christ, but I didn't, I had no idea what it was about. I, I knew a little, you know, about Christmas and Easter because we celebrated it with my dad and my dad's Christian side of the family, but I didn't know what what's the second coming. Um, and I had a lot of questions because I was just, I became curious, you know, what is what, okay, a second coming. And so I just ask a lot of prophecies like, well, how could he, you know, what, what, what prophecies did he fulfill then? Did he fulfill any? He said, oh, the lamb prophecies. And so then I, okay. So I'm looking at, you know, the lamb prophecies and we're going back to Isaiah 53, et cetera. In any case, um, Dave Thaxton, who's a Latter-day Saint and then, and Shay Owens, who's, uh, they're the two guys there, Latter-day Saint guys that were still very close very, very close best friends to this day. Um, they decide we, we just, we need to give this guy a book of Mormon because he's, he's never going to, you know, tr really understand what we're, we're talking about until he reads, you know, our, our scripture. And they're also hoping, well, he's pretty curious, right? So if he reads this book, who knows? <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, but I, when when you're a 14 year old, you just can't you can't sustain like a scriptural discussion for for very long either. Um, so they write their you know it's a Latter Day Saint tradition to write your testimony right in the Book of Mormon. I'm sure you've you've seen that or heard of that, and they they both do. They both you know write their on just on a single page. They they write their testimony of it and sign it. And then Dave goes through and he highlights all these different prophecies of the Messiah, you know, the lamb prophecies, the lion prophecies. I mean, I can't remember, you know, it's 20 years ago, but he, he did take a lot of time to go and like colored pencil, you know, all these different prophecies that I was asking questions about. So we go into the library where it's more quiet, reverent, and Dave pulls out a, this Book of Mormon, another Testament of Jesus Christ on the subtitle. And he said, Jason, you've been asking us a lot of questions about this book or, or about our religion. So we wanted to give you the, the Book of Mormon so that, you know, you could refer to the book to answer your questions. In fact, I've even highlighted, you know, answers to your questions about our religion. I said, well, I will. I'm not really interested in your religion. <laughs> He's like, well, no, you... You kind of are, right? You've been asking us questions. And I'm like, well, all right, well, okay, I guess I'm curious about your religion. I want to know what you believe, but I don't I don't believe it. I don't believe in what you believe, but I am curious about what you believe. So he said, okay, well, then take the book. And I took it, and I stuffed it in my backpack, um, you know, uh, a freshman, high schooler, right? And, um, you know, I've got geometry, social studies, you know, the big honking textbooks of those days. And it's, uh, you know, I put it in there. It's crushing the Book of Mormon. And the pages are getting rumpled and the covers getting, you know, messed up. And uh, one day, day, I asked Dave, we're, we're in our social studies class. And I said, hey, can you get my notebook? And then he he goes in and he sees the Book of Mormon all mangled. And he and he looks at me and he says, Jason, this is my sacred scripture. You know, what are you doing? Like, how would you feel if I did, you know, did that to a Torah scroll? And I was like, oh, I mean, I would not right? you. Can, in Judaism, if you drop a Torah scroll, the whole congregation has to 
collectively like fast for 40 days. <laughs> if you if you drop a right, so here I have I've like mangled his holy scripture. So I get uh I get super anxious. I I I, I at the moment I kind of want to just give it back to him, but I just couldn't. I just couldn't do that. Um, it's not really in my personality. So I th I think about throwing it away. I I really don't want to read it. Um, and then I settle on, you know, the uh, the fourteen year old boy, you know, solution to burn it, and uh, <laughs> the burning book. Oh, you're uh, you're muted there. Steve. Yes, I was muted. This would be the one reference to <laughs> the burning book that we could, uh, as apropos, I imagine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's how we we came up with the title. So I, uh, one of the ways. Um, so I took the book into the backyard. I took a lighter, you know, from the the cupboard. Because and... this is the other thing too is that you also need, felt like you needed to destroy it because you didn't you want you didn't want your mom to find it either. That's right. Yeah. Right. And I thought, well, if I if I throw in the garbage, you know, there's a chance she could see it in the trash or I mean, I, I was 14. I my brain was not fully formed. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I went went outside, you know, I hid the book under my shirt. I put the lighter in my pocket and I went, you know, around midnight because I, I wanted to go after everybody's asleep. And I, you know, I made sure everybody's asleep. And I went, you know, I was in between the garage and the the fence, the neighbor's fence. And it's just a very narrow, kind of gravelly, you know, Arizona backyard, right? And I pull out the book from under my shirt, pull out the lighter, and I hold the book up. And I'm about to flick the switch of the lighter. And I, I just feel a piercing and i feel a voice um that says do not burn my book and it it feels very very much like god is trying to reach out to me because i i i was always a a very fervent believer in god and in scripture and um I, I had heard about revelations, right, from from the Torah um, and God speaking, right? So I I had to assume that God was really speaking to me. and uh, But I started to feel like this Book of Mormon that I was holding had a different weight to it. And I thought of it at first as just like a missionary propaganda. But then I had a, this just an impression that it could be scripture. And that was the first moment where I, I just had that idea that it it could be a scripture. Um, no idea what it was about. I had heard about Indians gold plates. That was it. <laughs> and uh, and so I go in my room. It's now it's you know twelve thirty a.m. It's after midnight. I turn on my lamp, and I start to read. You know, and I. And then I saw on the title page, you know, uh, I'll just just quote this real quickly because it's, I think it's uh, it's pretty interesting, what the, what the language is, um, and it you know and it says that uh, it says it's this is to show unto the remnant of the house of Israel what great things the Lord hath done for their fathers, and that they may know the covenants of the Lord that they are not cast off forever, and also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. So it is it is a smack-in-the-face title page. I mean, the most unusual thing that you could ever read after almost burning a book um, and so mm -hmm. for me, it was like, oh my goodness, I didn't even, this is about the house of Israel. It's about Jew and Gentile. It's about the covenants of Israel. And I had no, I had no clue. I mean, even my friends didn't really even explain what the book of Mormon was even about. So, so I started to read and, and, uh, and that's how, 
you know, if you wanted to talk about, I mean, uh, well, here the story opens up in yeah. Jerusalem. This, these are your people. It's talking about prophets. It's talking about it's. This is familiar to you. This is familiar language. It's uh, and it's talking about a lot of things that you uh, that would resonate with you as a Jewish uh, person. So, so engaging yeah. the text must have really been an eye-opening experience for you. It was. It was. It was. It was kind of blowing me away because the Book of Mormon prophets, you know, are referring back to Jerusalem again and again, and to even to the Jews, the Jewish people, the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, you know, the restoration of Israel. You know, here I thought, oh. You know, Christianity is all about how the church superseded Israel. And the Book of Mormon is the inverse, that God is actually trying to restore Israel and um, kind of close out the times of the Gentiles. Um, and so it's very interesting things about Israel and the Gentiles and, and the tr you know, some of the tribes co coming to ancient America. And I, I had just no idea. Um, and um, I mean, the one thing that I can say is uh, <clears throat> I think um, Third Nephi was the most impressive once I got there hmm. because, I mean, just for, for the mo more immediate context is, you know, Rabbi Tovia Singer was and I was, you know, I was studying what he's saying. I didn't just trust his authority, but I, I was definitely respectful of his ideas. Um, I just didn't automatically believe Tovia Sager, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, but his whole thing was, you know, these are the prophecies that the Messiah must fulfill. And if he doesn't fulfill them, he's just a candidate. And then I go and I look at, um, you know, Third Nephi, when I get there and I actually something that I think is actually very different from the new Testament is the third Nephi demonstrates what I consider to be full messianic power. Hmm. And you actually see a, a type of the second coming or, yeah. or the, the lion very you much. See yep. it, you see, you see a lion, right? Cause I'm very concerned. I'm like, that's yeah. nice. The, the lamb Messiah is really nice, but, as a Jewish person, I'm looking for a lion messiah. Like, yeah. you know, I, if if it's a lion and a lamb, great. But like, I I need the lion. Like, if you don't if you don't have the lion, then you don't have anything. That's astonishing. I never would have thought of <laughs> approaching the text that way. But from a Jewish perspective, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, and so I mean, so I'm reading about right. Jesus is in the in Third Nephi. He's he's. <laughs> For, for lack of a better term, he's fireballing wicked yeah. cities, right? Well, it's the apocalypse. It's the apocalypse happening in the in the uh, new world. So you have a bit of the Jesus of the book of Revelation and you have the Jesus of, you know, the risen Christ combined into one character. It's, right. it's a remarkable way of, uh, it's a remarkable story. Yeah. Yeah. And so I'm seeing this and I'm seeing, okay, I'm seeing, oh, this is messianic power. Okay. Like, messianic like. Power. Right. He's he's doing he's doing lion stuff. He's doing the lion stuff that I want him to do. Yeah. He's destroying the wicked cities. He's he's putting earthquakes over them. Yeah. And he's he's getting rid of all these wicked criminals, right? And uh and then all that's left, you know, and you have third Nephi eleven. The only people that, that are left are the innocent, you know, righteous people and their kids, right? And the children. Beautiful, right? I mean he's He's blessing children. He's healing everybody. You know, let the little children come to me. Do you, do you have any that are maimed or uh, among you? You know, bring them hither, and I will heal them. For my my bowels are filled with mercy toward you. I'm I'm full of compassion. And then and so you're you're seeing you're seeing the lion and the lamb, and he's he's destroying the wicked. He's he's healing the the righteous. Um, he's setting up Zion you know, a, a classless society where there's no poor or rich. Um, everybody's righteous. Um, you know, there's peace, you know, there's. Yeah. For, well, this, and you have a proto millennium going on that, uh, that will come out. Like it's a proto millennium. It's like almost like a, it's almost like a, a sneak peek of, of the future that you get to see uh, take place in the pages of the book of Mormon. Exactly. 
That's <laughs> yeah, proto millennium. That's a great, that's a great term. So I'm seeing, oh, well, here's a guy. It says Jesus Christ, and he's doing the Messiah stuff. Right. I, I have a friend. We talk about you know he's doing the King David stuff, right? <laughs> Right, because as a Jew, you know the Messiah has got to do the. He's got to at least do the King David stuff. Plus, he's got to also be better than King David, because then uh, you know otherwise, just you could just settle for King David. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm seeing it, and and he's establishing Zion. He's establishing a kingdom, but you know, a political order, a spiritual order, and you know, unfortunately, it only lasts for two centuries. You go into fourth Nephi and. It only lasts for it's supposed you know it's supposed to last a thousand years right, but I don't think that you know that deeply about it. I just see messianic power. Yeah, and then also I I understand the lamb stuff right. I mean I'm like okay I see the lion stuff, mm -hmm. and then I start to understand the lamb stuff right the atonement, um, this infinite and eternal sacrifice, um, and then also. You know the the great the great question. Um, I talk about uh, I had I hadn't articulated it as clearly, but right, you clearly see like up to Third Nephi chapter nine, the people in the Book of Mormon are doing the Law of Moses, animal sacrifices, you know, blood blood offerings, burnt offerings, and and I mean we could see pretty clearly that they're doing you know that system of atonement, but then Jesus comes and. He uh, then he 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 changes it. I mean, I like to think of it nowadays as like, you know, readjust. You, you don't you're not getting a new mortgage. You're just refinancing the mortgage that you have. And so, you know, he's sacrificed himself, so he's got to he, he can actually you know refinance the mortgage by instituting a sacrament or a communion, so that we're just remembering his his body and his blood instead of you know sacrificing new animals every single time we sin um and so you know it's actually a more efficient system of atonement right um and and that appeals to me um because i i don't really know exactly what to do with yom kippur the day of atonement i'm like i'm like okay i got this one day that i gotta like bring all my sins and repent of everything and you know, and I, I was, I was a Jew who took that seriously when we had the Rosh Hashanah, the, you know, the new year, and then we have Yom Kippur and there's a 10 day window. And we were taught that this is called the, the gates of repentance. And so you've got this 10 day window to make sure you're, you know, you're repenting of all your sins and you're asking for forgiveness from people that you've wronged. And that, you know, that was part of stuff we did even as kids, we would go and you know, we'd read the prayers and the rabbis would teach us, hey, you got to you got to take these 10 days really seriously. And so that was the way I dealt with sin and forgiveness as a Jew. And I felt some connection to it. But then, you know, well, what about all these animal sacrifices in the Torah? You know, and we, we I mean, and so, you know, they say, oh, well, when you fast, you're you're offering up the fat in your body as a as yeah, a, right. as a, as a burnt yeah. offering. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, Oh, well that kind of makes sense. And your prayers, I'm like, okay, but I mean, the book of Mormon kind of was framing this. Oh, well, you know, if, you know, the Messiah offers himself as a final, you know, infinite and eternal sacrifice for sin, that's, you know, maybe that's a thing. And then eventually I, you know, I, I become convinced of the need for baptism because I'm seeing people in the book of Mormon getting baptized. And... Right, and this is the this is the other thing too. It's as you are reading the Book of Mormon, this is when you recognize that you feel that Jesus is the Messiah, right? Yeah, it, it's it's entirely from the Book of Mormon, right? So because I see for yeah, you, I, this Jewish yep. boy, you engage the text, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Messiah. Reading the Book of Mormon, I think it's really important that my evangelicals hear this. Okay, so you 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 yeah. have a confession of Jesus as the Messiah by reading the Book of Mormon, and then you see, I need to get baptized. And of course, that you run into some issues there. It's not quite so easy to do as uh, as you might think. But you you have this, uh, this, this, you have this, you have this uh, spiritual yearning to want to be baptized as be, uh, engaging the text. Yes, and th that's, that is it. I, I come to this realization and uh, acknowledgement, a testimony that Jesus is the Messiah. 
right? The the as it says in the title page, the eternal God manifesting himself unto all nations. That's a whole nother issue, right? The eternal God, right? I think embracing him as Messiah is one thing, embracing him as an eternal God is another thing. And we could talk about that if you want. But um I decide that if he's the Messiah, which I the text leads me to conclude that he is. He's he's got the lion power, he's got the lamb power. All that I'm really waiting for is for him to come again because I I now I have confidence. Literally I have my faith is confidence that he could do the lion stuff and the King David stuff, which I need him to do to be a Jewish Messiah. Because um, I, 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 I need a Jewish Messiah. I don't, I don't need any other kind of Messiah. So I, um, and then I see that baptism is the way that you commit yourself to follow him. And you know, there's some, you know, is baptism a covenant, you know, and I've developed a, a very nuanced approach to that, but I, I I'm not thinking about it as a covenant at this point. For me, I was already born into the covenant. I was born into the covenant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and circumcised and bar mitzvah, son of the commandments. You know, I've I I had already voluntarily committed myself to Jewish covenant, and I I, I took the bar mitzvah very seriously. So what what do I need baptism for? If I've already got a covenant with God, well, I see baptism as really as uh is the 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 ordinance that I need to to uh, open up the open up mercy to open up a, a channel for forgiveness because I realize well I I have fallen short I have not kept the commandments as I should have so I've definitely sinned so. Baptism in the Book of Mormon is presented as this way that I can be washed of my sins and like come out clean. <laughs> I also belong to a a brand a branch of Judaism that had completely abandoned the mikvah and uh, Jew or or Jewish baptism Jewish immersion. Mikvah is so Orthodox Jewish communities almost all have what's a mikvah, and uh, after certain sins or impurities. You know, there's, you know, there's sin and impurity. Um, you can go to the mikvah as a Jew, and you could be ritually immersed. And but I didn't even have that. So I mean, you could. Some could argue, kind of like almost in a Freudian way, or you know, psychoanalytically, that I I also had this Jewish need for baptism, mm. okay. which I probably could have got in Orthodox Judaism, but I I was never it wasn't afforded to you. Mm. I was never afforded to it, so I kind of felt I, I need I need this water immersion. Oh, okay. And but I but I also acknowledge Jesus is the Christ, so the be, I I kind of determined the best way to do that is probably be baptized by a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, since I actually didn't even know about mikvah. I mean, I wasn't thinking about that, so I call Shay, the one you know the the buddy, um. And uh, and I was friends with him longer because we be we had become friends when we were. Now, like, and didn't you call him like at five well, o'clock in the morning? You called him like at five o'clock in the morning, wasn't it? Is that right? <laughs> it wasn't. Well, I, I called I called both. Yeah, I okay. called. I think I called Dave. I might. I think I called Dave first, and I said, "Hey, this Book of Mormon that you gave me. Uh, I want you to know I've been reading it," and he was like, "He he just thought he was like, oh, go back to bed." This, this is just a prank. And I said, said, Dave, I know it's true. Wow. Uh, apparently Dave remembers it better than I do. And I was like just weeping and um and then it was very awkward at school that day. <laughs> 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 so and I think we like kind of kept it a secret. Hmm. Um because none of us really knew what to do. And so you know, we're only 14. And um and I think Dave was like Dave told me much, you know, you know, 20 years later, and when we were writing the book, Dave told me that he was actually kind of angry with me because as a 14 year old, he did not have that like certain witness that the Book of Mormon was true himself. So he kind of like 
he kind of dismissed me. He was like, okay, you believe it's true. Cool. And I was like, oh, all right. I thought, and but he was kind of had that, you know, that brotherly envy. Like, well, mm. I don't know it's true like Jason does. And I was born in the church. Right. So I, I think Dave was, as Dave and I have tried to reconstruct the story, um, I think I was like, oh, well, Dave is like, he's not really like supporting me. So I think that's why I called Shay and I was like, okay, maybe Shay will help me out with, like, cause what do I do next? Yeah. All I know is that I want to be baptized secretly, you know, Nick Nicodemus style. Like, I'm like, I don't, you know, I don't want to actually become a Latter-day Saint. I just, so I call Shay and I said, okay, Shay, I, I know it's true. I go through the same, right. And, um, Shay is shocked and, and I, and, and now this is what I like, what do we do next? And I was like, Shay, I want to bap- I want to be baptized. Like I want to go to the lake, you know, like the guys in the book of Mormon. And, and I want, and can you baptize me? Cause I know you, I trust you. And I know that I can trust you that you'll keep this a secret. And then I can just be baptized and I can just be washed of my sins. That's like, that's all I want. I just want to be washed of my sins. And then I want to continue on as a Jew. <laughs> You know, and I'll be a secret believer in Jesus. So Shay is like, you know, he gets very formal about it. And he says, well, there's a process and you've got to meet with the missionaries and you've got to talk to the bishop. And, you know, and then um, you're going to have to get your we we'll have to get your parents permission because, you know, you, we, I can't just baptize you in secret. And I was like, oh, this is not going the way I wanted it to go. So, so, um, and and that's just Shay set a boundary. He's like, he's like, no, I I can't. Nobody's. This is a church of order. I was like, oh shoot, yeah. which I've always, you know, I've always been a kind. Maybe I, I've struggled with that as my kind of democratic Jewishness, um, and that's probably the first uh, eruption of, um, and you know, as you know, Judaism is not hierarchical. It's right. It's, it's flat it's horizontal and you know i was just hoping to make a deal yeah making a deal that sounds that sounds very jewish you know yeah <laughs> and so so then i i work up the courage because i've got this boundary so i sheepishly ask my mom one day a couple yeah. weeks go by hey mom um i gotta tell you something you know dave and shay gave me a book of mormon I believe in it. Um, I want to follow Jesus and I want to be baptized. Um, I don't want to like go to church every Sunday and like do that whole thing, but I just, I really want to be baptized, but they're telling me I need your permission to be baptized. And I, I, I need to be baptized. Like I feel like God wants me to, is commanding me to be baptized. So I, I have to ask my mom and, and I, I don't know. I don't have a choice. So that is where she, of course, says, no, no, thank you. Um, And that is where she makes a very wise decision to introduce me to study with Orthodox rabbis. So that's where we, that's where we get to the Orthodox rabbis. You know, Jason needs some, some more, a a meteor, like a a, a meteor form of Judaism. Yeah. Yeah. Because he's a very Orthodox boy. Okay. He just he just got he just got born into uh, a more secular family. Okay. Uh, or and not not secular as an anti-religious, but just you know not as um, not as deep into it. You could say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I agreed, and I said that would be wonderful. I would love to study. I mean, I was like at the same time, I was like. Well, yeah, I guess I just wanted to get baptized and then become a more observant Jew, I guess. So I, I, in some ways, I I was totally fine with it. I still wanted to be baptized, but I felt, well, if I study with the Orthodox rabbis, like my mom wants me to, then maybe she'll give me that permission mm-hmm. to get baptized. Yeah. I mean, I'm still like 14, 15, and my brain is all over the place. But so I started, yeah, I, I start studying with Rabbi Raphael. He also teaches at the Hebrew high school, but now I can 
t- study with him one on one. And and uh, it's called Hevruta, you know, uh, companion study. And um and and that is what you do like in a yeshiva, right? You in Judy the tradition is you know um studying one on one is probably like the most effective way to study Torah, right? And and I really look forward to it. Like I I go faithfully, and I once I become turn sixteen, and I get a I have a car. I drive myself. Uh, no nobody's pulling my teeth. I'm going very willfully and 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 lovingly to uh, and I and I love it. I mean it's part of who I am, and it's you know the rabbi has you know the the kolel. The study study center has a uh, this amazing library of Jewish books, and you know just the deep knowledge of of the tradition. And uh, anyway, I love it. I uh, I work up the courage after like two years, something like that, and I I ask Rabbi Raphael, or I, I bring up to him. Hey, I, I need to talk to you about something because <laughs> we're, you know, we're talking about the Torah. We're just doing what I would would have done, you know, and the weekly Torah portion, um, the Garden of Eden, some mystical stuff, you know, the real nature of Adam and Eve and, you know, what what the, the tree of knowledge. What does that really mean? You know, angels, God, heaven, the world to come, you know, super like. uh I guess you'd say like plan of salvation or plan of redemption kind of stuff in sure. in Latter Day Saint language, because <clears throat> um, that's the kind of stuff that's on my mind. But then I say I got to talk to you about Jesus, you know, and because uh, I'm kind of I'm I'm withholding it from him because like I I want I don't want him to just throw me away, which you know which is kind of silly to think about that because, um. So I wait and I wait and I wait and and then I bring it up to him and we we talk about Matthew five because um, by this time now I've got a New Testament <laughs> and so now I'm like trying to work work out you know the historical Jesus right I mean um, and what what did Jesus actually teach um, when when he was on Earth as as a mortal as a, as a you know. Uh, a a mortal right i mean the jesus of the book of mormon is he i mean he is beyond history because he's he's already resurrected right right coming in transcendentally Mm -hmm. i mean i i believe as a believing latter-day saint that jesus the jesus of the book of mormon entered into history and he actually did some ministry but he's still uh you know he's a transcendental jesus Mm -hmm. but then you've got a historical Jesus, right? In the in the New Testament. Um, and of course, you know, I still argue that the New Testament is vital as Latter-day Saints because if Latter-day Saints, we believe in the atonement, the sacrifice, the sacrifice happened in, in the New Testament. So we don't the Book of Mormon peoples are beneficiaries of the atonement, but they he doesn't perform the atonement in ancient America. So so in that way, from you know a Christian point of view, I think you need you know even Latter Day Saints we depend on mm-hmm. the record of the New Testament. Absolutely, yeah. <clears throat> in that way, but um, uh, yeah, we read uh, was it Matthew five? You know, think not that I come to destroy the law; I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Um, except your righteousness exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees, um, you shall in no case enter the kingdom of heaven. And you know, not one jot or tittle of the law shall pass away until all be fulfilled. And so I, I, I bring that to Rabbi Raphael, and I say, it looks like Jesus, like the historical Jesus, is saying, you know, you've got to keep the the, the commandments of the Torah, the mitzvahs. Um, and, and uh, actually, I was interpreting it that you need to keep them even more righteously than. The scribes and the Pharisees. He's basically saying, "Hey, I'm, I'm a more observant Jew than the scribes and Pharisees." If you read it, I mean, at least the way I did, the way it struck me, you know. And then, obviously, what does it mean by fulfilling the law? And does that mean that what he just taught is immediately s- suspended 
and superseded as soon as he dies or is resurrected? I mean, those are all different questions, but I'm just reading it and trying to convince the rabbi that I can be an observant Jew, keep the commandments of the Torah, and believe in Jesus, and that Jesus is like supporting me to do that. So he kind of acknowledges that, and he said, well, yeah, he said, you should you should do what Jesus is saying. And I was like, oh, <laughs> here's this Orthodox rabbi. You should keep the Torah commandments, you know, do what Jesus says. And, you know, and uh, I mean, even Jesus, there's other parts where Jesus in Matthew, I thought, I think also in Matthew five, you know, the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses's seat. What whatsoever they teach you or bid you that you should do. Um, but, and then he kind of talks about their hypocrisy, but he, there is an interpretation that, you know, the oral law, Jesus is maybe supporting or endorsing the oral law, right? Mm -hmm. That the scribes and Pharisees sit in Moses's seat. So they're, they can authoritatively, authoritatively interpret the halakha, the, uh, the, the details of how to do these mitzvahs. Um, I mean, I think it's all kind of there and, you know, Messianic Jews work through this a lot, right? Um, anyway, but, the rabbi just tells me, I mean, he really gets into orthopraxy, as we call it, right? He said, this is all speculation, Jason. Like, if you if you believe Jesus is going to be the Messiah, that's that's between you and God. But, you know, you were born a Jew, and you're obligated to the Sinai covenant. You know, that, I mean, there's the tradition that every Jewish soul was present at Mount Sinai that every Jewish soul made the Sinai covenant. And so when we're born, if you're born a Jew, you actually had made that covenant spiritually before you were born. <laughs> so, I mean, that's Same a very, <laughs> very, yeah, very strong Jewish tradition. Right. And I feel it too. Cause like I had a bar mitzvah and I was like, yeah, I'm going to live in an observant Jewish life. So the rabbi says, okay, well, whether or not Jesus is the Messiah, that's beside the point, Jason. The point is, is that you are obligated to to Jewish covenant, and you can't you can't violate that and expect to you know serve Hashem uh, the way that He expects you to live and serve Him. So, and I feel that He's right, right? So we have, I mean, we have this very complex conversation, you know, and of course the the uh, traditional joke, you know, when the Messiah comes, uh, we'll ask him if it's his first time or second time, you know, and, uh, you know, and the rap Rabbi Raphael, if it's his first time, I'm right. Second time, you're right. But he's like acknowledging that you're still in the Sinai covenant. You're still obligated to 613 commandments the best you can. And that ties into the land of Israel. Rabbi Raphael was also a dual citizen of Israel. He studied at a yeshiva in Jerusalem. I mean, so anyway, you can see all these also Zionist percolations, mm -hmm. inceptions coming into my life. Um, and, 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 and he's the one that introduces me to this idea that, you know, only in the land of Israel can we accomplish all this, the commandments. Because, you know, two-thirds of the commandments uh, can only be done in Israel. So he's the one that I remember that in high school. And that always stuck with me because I was like a pretty orthodox kind of kid. So I'm like, oh, you either go all the way or you, or you don't. Hmm. So, so that was, I was something I always wrestled with, you know, how do you keep all as many of the Jewish commandments as possible? Well, you, you know, a lot of them, you know, you got they're connected to the land of Israel, so you got to be in Israel to actually perform that commandment. So it's so fascinating because here you are, you're getting schooling from an Orthodox rabbi, and you still have a testimony of Jesus being the Messiah. And yep. then, um, and even after all of this, uh, and even efforts from your mom, your mom yep. uh, would later uh, bring in a counter cult uh, expert named Rick Ross into the picture. Yeah, try to prevent you from getting baptized because you decided when you turned eighteen at some point that you were going to get baptized because you could to, could do it then without your parents' permission. Maybe talk a little bit about Rick Ross, the Rick Ross incident, because it seems to me like on paper, I, you you can tell your mom was sincere and she was she was just looking out for you, 
But Rick yeah. Ross kind of showed you the futility of the tactics that he used. Now, Rick Ross, pretty famous counter cult guy, especially in the 80s and 90s, kind of a controversial guy. Um, yeah. Well, no, and I remember I was I was aware of him. I remember he was on TV shows and he was he's pretty, pretty well you know known. But he was, a, I yeah. guess he was more of like a secular Jew who. Uh, yes. Was, yeah. And so let me just talk a little bit about him and your your experience with him trying to talk you out of uh, getting joining this cult. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you, Stephen. So. So we're uh, I'm 18 now. Um, it's I've graduated from high school. So now I'm like, hey, I can get baptized. I can get baptized, right? Whether you like it or not. And um, and uh, it's getting pretty desperate, right? Because I've studied with the Orthodox rabbi for like three years. I've gone to Jews for Judaism and talked with the you know a specialist uh, rabbi Kravitz, who's wonderful, wonderful, and you know, and it's it's not working, right? Um, although you know. Perhaps I could have spent more time with Jews for Judaism when, you know, that's their job to, to try to keep you in the, you know, in the Jewish fold. But, um, I only spent like one day with them. Um, but they're, you know, they were all, they were in Los Angeles <clears throat> and I'm in Phoenix. So, um, and we didn't have zoom, right. We didn't have zoom calls. Uh, but so my mom, I, I think she's getting more desperate and I, you know, I need to do something more psychologically you know, invasive to get, to shake him from the, the, the cult. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so they, yeah, they hire Rick Ross for, and he's out based out of New Jersey, Jersey city. And he, he flies out to Phoenix. He also has some roots in Phoenix as well. And he brings like uh, a, a briefcase full of, you know, anti-Mormon literature. And he's, yeah, he's, as you said, he's a secular Jew. Um, I was unsure whether he believes in God, which should, was not, not going to resonate very well. Um, and I'm a little weird and I, cause I'm also studying with the missionaries by this point. And um, so I, you know, Rick comes into the house and I, you know, I want to start it off with a opening, opening prayer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause I, you know, I want there to be some, inspiration right. right some divine guidance you know lead lead us all to the truth you know lead lead me to the truth lead rick rick to the truth maybe who knows <laughs> um and i'll never forget right rick i i'd really like this to open this up with a prayer you know um of course i was you know i'm only 18 so i'm like can i pray you know i mean i guess now i'd be like hey rick you could pray you know i would be a little bit more confident um but I like I need to pray because like this guy's gonna attack my my beliefs. I know I can feel it coming, and he just looks at me like I'm insane, <laughs> and um and like look he's in a cult because he's he wants to pray mm -hmm. before yeah. a religious before a religious discussion. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness, <laughs> you know, uh, right? So I'm like okay, um. And yeah, it was very painful with my mom being there, kind of endorsing, I guess, like her approach, her kind of gut approach, like, you know, let's let's intervene with some some old fashioned secularism mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, which doesn't work on people. Right. It some people are more religious. Some people are more secular. Some people are in between. You've got to just kind of be respectful where people are at. Right. You can't you know, that people have their nature. And, um, and I was very comfortable with Orthodox rabbis, right? I could tell them anything. We, could, we, we literally could talk about anything. Um, but Rick was, he had an agenda and he's got the stack of the Book of Mormon stuff and a stack of the Joseph Smith stuff. And he just hits me for three days straight, you know, eight hour, eight hour day. You know, he's got his, his nine to five schedule and, and he's just, pummeling me he gives me like a little lunch break and then we're back at it so what you know, kind of just, just i'm curious what kind of anti-mormon materials was he using do you remember was he using in the tanners stuff was he using any evangelical stuff or was it all secular in, in nature do, do you it remember? was secular because i mean okay. he's a secular right. reformed jew mm -hmm. so but I, I i don't i can't i mean this was like 20 years ago so 
I mean, he uh, he could have been using sources from evangelical, but that would have been kind of strange. Like, why would you, as a secular Jew, right, use right? That's how I was curious. Yeah, religious evangelical arguments against right. Mormonism. I mean, that would that's like then you're not even really having any integrity in what you're doing right. at all. Right. So, and I was always kind of like Rick. Like, I respect Judaism. Like, um. All I can remember uh, distinctly was uh, he. Um, we started talking. I wanted to talk about like the the universality of Mormonism and kind of the the very the very large heaven that Mormonism has. Right, Mormonism has a very large heaven. I mean, um, and a very very tiny hell. <laughs> You know, as you know, I mean, basically, if you look at it, if you zoom out from a certain perspective, you have a celestial kingdom of heaven or glory of heaven, terrestrial, telestial, right? These are all degrees of of heaven, of what we would define as heaven. And then a very, very tiny, very minuscule hell, you know, called perdition. And it, basically in Mormonism, you, you only, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, um you you only go to perdition if you want to go <laughs> um so like you know if you have false if you believe in false doctrine right uh it, you're not going to go to perdition just because you believe in false doctrine mm -hmm. you only go to perdition because you know the truth and then you you know you willfully decide to Basically, you, you knowingly decide to worship Satan, and you want to be with Satan. Therefore, you're going to go to perdition. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, you know, goes to a degree, a portion, in Jewish terms, right? A portion of the world to come, or a degree of of glory, of heaven, of of, of heaven. I mean, it's just you no know, big heaven, tiny hell. So I th I think that that's really cool, and I I kind of feel like oh, like this kind of secular. Jewish reform guy, he maybe he'll appreciate, you know, mm -hmm. this really, really big, you know, heaven that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints that that even has a place for him. Right. <laughs> he know, didn't appreciate you don't, it though. You don't even need to believe in Jesus to go right. to a degree of glory, right? Right. right. I mean, um, <clears throat> uh, and it, so he he just like he rejects it. He just. He just thinks it's bogus because he's just like he's not even thinking about heaven or the world to right. come. Right, it doesn't matter. Very... But to see, this is the key thing: is that if you're a cult, typically cults are we're the one true church, and anybody else that's outside of this group is going to hell. And yeah. I think what you're trying to demonstrate is that's not what they believe. So by definition, cults are very exclusive and very, uh, very much about. Uh, saying that we're it and we're the only remnant that's going to survive all of this and everybody else is you know within the christian context almost all christian cults are like that they're the one true right. church. you guys claim to be the one true church but you don't have a view of other groups as all being damned because they don't belong to the right group so i think that kind of is what differentiates it from let's say the jehovah's witnesses right because yeah. that i could argue is more of a cult than, than, than I would say about Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's that's the distinction that I make, too. I think it's important that people... Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's, that was actually... A, I thought that was a great tactic for you to use because that's basically what you're, you're telling them as an 18-year-old. Yeah, that's a great point, Stephen. Like, I didn't... Yeah, I mean, I never thought of it from that angle, but I, I guess... I mean, I'm only 18, so my brain right. is not even fully formed, but I'm trying to say that there's... Yeah. I guess I was trying to tell him that there's some religious pluralism baked yeah. into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Exactly. Which kind of undermines and, the whole idea of them being a cult at that point. Right. And then I, I actually challenge him and I say, I'd like to demonstrate to you like the even broader pluralistic nature mm -hmm. of this teaching. Because I remember Rabbi Raphael told me that, you know, only um, basically the righteous are even going to be resurrected. So if you're if you're a sinner, right, or you die as yep. a sinner, you in Judaism you won't even be resurrected. Mm -hmm. You won't even have a share in the world to come. You'll just stay in the grave. And so I I, I said I, I I challenged him, kind of like you know, 
an arrogant 18 year old. And I said, we're going to call the rabbi. We're going to call the rabbi. So we call him. Hey, Rabbi Raphael, I'm, I'm just t- having a conversation. I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, what is Judaism's teaching about, you know, the resurrection? Who, who's going to be resurrected into the world to come? And he said, oh, only those who are righteous, who keep the commandments. Uh, I mean, also non-Jews. If, the non, if non-Jews keep the seven Noahide laws, they can also be resurrected and have a, we, you know, in Judaism have a share in the world to come. And I, and I said, oh, thank you, Rabbi. And I said, see, look, it, the nice thing about the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is everybody's going to get resurrected, even if you're the worst sinner. And, and I, I said, isn't that nice that this is an even bigger heaven uh, than, you know, this Orthodox Judaism? And he mm-hmm. was like, and he, it just didn't resonate with no, him at all. It's unfortunate. He just, and he just was like, no, you're, it's a cult. It's mind control. Yeah. And I'm like, hey, like, I'm only 18, but I, I think I'm demonstrating like, even like some doctrinal Mm -hmm. differences between what I want to join, what I have. Yeah. Because it begs the question, if you, if if you, you're, you belong to Judaism is basically saying it's a very, only, only the righteous will get resurrected. So very few will actually have an opportunity to, to experience paradise. And so you're trying to demonstrate to this guy that actually Judaism is actually more exclusive than the church that I belong to. And so the question would be, why, why aren't you going after Judaism? <laughs> you know, <laughs> this begs the question. And so, and that's the other thing too, is like, you know, all religions, there are cult-like, all religions have a cult-like, as, uh, cult-like aspects to them. When Christianity first started, yeah. it was a cult, you know, it was a Jewish cult. I mean, you know, it, it evolved yeah. into, you know, the religion that, that we have today. But, you know, that's, that's, that's what I don't like about secular thinking is that it's just as black and white and fundamentalist as as the, the some of the people that they go after and they're they have this unwillingness to listen to other people that's what frustrates me that's why i get frustrated by people who attack me well you're an evangelical which means this 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 and this and it's like no it doesn't mean any of that but you're not taking the yeah. time to engage us in a conversation because you have already through your bias biases your anti-religious biases which is yep. a form of bigotry yes um, are con- discriminating against me and my beliefs Indeed. and i see that this is this is what rick was doing to you so good for you <laughs> yeah and, that, and, that, and that, i mean that's kind of where i i think my birth as a as a religious pluralist was was born ah because then i started to realize like look at look at me like i have a good relationship with these rabbis even though i don't agree with them on everything and then my life would progress and i realized i could have good relationships with evangelicals or catholics or muslims or you know people of, of faith of other traditions um, and that I could be comfortable, um, and uh, and that I could, you know, r- religious difference is not a, a threat to my existence. Um, but but militant, militant secularism, yes, because you know these kind of people. They, you know, Rick Ross was actually, I think, indicted for like like actually kidnapping somebody to try to deprogram mm-hmm. them, and mm-hmm. you could see how he made that decision. Yeah, and it's like, hey, like. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Let's. Just, I just want to have a dialogue, right? You know, like just dialogue, mm-hmm. you know. But he he's not. He's so militantly secular that he's not capable of like real. And he becomes genuine the very, he dialogue. Becomes, he becomes right. the very thing that he's going after. Right, right, right. Once you can justify kidnapping somebody, you've gone full blown fundamentalist, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, he's like, yeah, you become a fundamentalist secularist, right? Right. Like, Exactly. I've always, and that's kind of where I figured, oh, like there's this space of like pluralistic people, right? Okay. And we can all get along. It's the fundamentalists over here and over here yep. that are just trying to enforce their ways on us that uh, are not leaving us space to to breathe. So I, I have to tell you, this conversation is going super well. And it's hard to believe that we only got to your 18th birthday. We haven't gotten to your oh. baptism yet. There's so much to talk about here and there's so many and 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 I don't I almost feel like I want to have you back on at some point too to continue the story because folks I have to tell you there is the reason I talk about Rick Ross and Tovia Singer make sure you bring us is that they make another appearance in this book and and <laughs> and, and what makes it so cool is it really for me it has to be a god thing sometimes where you end up serving your mission and it, it, it enables you to encounter them later in the book, which I want people to buy this book and read about this fantastic story about 
uh, I kind of see like almost like some closure that you get in this whole thing. I, I also feel like I, I love Tovia Singer. I don't want to, I would not have a beer with Rick Ross. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tovia is a good guy. Tovia is, yeah. to, Tovia is not, I can get along with him. He's a, he's a little intense, but but I respect him. Yeah. I, 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 I respect I respect Tovia Singer. I do too. Actually, I do too. Honestly, I do too. And I, I, uh, I, I you know, there's so much that happens in this story, folks. Okay. You become an Israeli citizen, a dual citizen. You live in yeah. Israel. You you then go to Brandeis University, which is a traditional uh, university. Oh no, of course Brandeis. Then you went to Israel, um, and you have you have <coughs> friends with a Palestinian a Christian who's kind of an anti-Zionist. And at this this time, as what happens is that your yeah. Zionism is growing and growing and growing. And what's so fascinating is in this book, as the story progresses, it it makes perfect sense. It it not, after reading your book, it's almost like okay, I get why a Jewish person would get something out of Mormonism. Because it's different than Protestant and Catholic Christianity. It has temples. It has yeah. covenants. It has a lot of the things that would resonate with the Jewish person. And the core purpose of the Book of Mormon is to uh, to uh, reach out to, to help restore Israel and the Jewish people. And they even were predicting in 1840 when Orson Hyde made his, went to Jerusalem and declared that the Jews would one day return to Israel. Yeah. This, this is a, a Zionist religion, a pr proto-Zionist religion, if you will, before even Zionism. It was start, it was a Zionist thing. Wouldn't you agree? I would. I, I think there's also some, some very strong and, and rich uh, evangelical yes. uh, traditions of Christian Zionism as well. And Dispen you know, dispensation dispensationalism. dispensationalism but i i would i would also argue that the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints is a form of dispensationalism yep it is it is very much so i agree it could right out of the 19th century dispensationalist tradition no question about that and actually yeah. i'm glad you brought that up because you we had talked about this before that you've actually had you've actually had positive experiences with evangelical christians vis-a-vis -vis israel maybe talk to that talk about that a little bit oh well, um, I, I mean, I hope I hope he doesn't mind. I'll just say his first name. Uh, I have a very, very good evangelical friend named Kyle. Um, and he's one of my best friends. And um, I mean, partly because I was uh, I, I, you know, I, I I'm happy about uh, Christian and evangelical support for Israel. I mean, my father is in that tradition. I mean, one thing I always tell Jewish people, but I should also tell other people too, is, you know, my father is basically a born again Christian. My mother is a reformed Jew, and, and neither of them ever converted each other, or converted to each other's religions. They just maintain their own marital pluralism for, you know, thirty. Well, I guess coming up on forty years. Uh, but my father is definitely, you know. A Christian Zionist, like he, okay. he's he, you know, he doesn't go to Washington D.C. and uh, you know lobby people, but he he believes, right? He 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 reads the Bible in a dispensational way. Okay. Um. He he acknowledges God's co eternal covenant with the Jewish people. It's it's allowed him theologically to remain married to a Jewish woman and not try to convert her. Okay. Right. Yeah. I mean, the way he reads the Bible is the way that he, you know, maintains a happy marriage, I suppose. OK. And I, I actually have, that leads me to a question. I'm really curious. Let's say if you were 13 or 14 and you went to your mom and said, I want to become a Lutheran. Would your mom have, have fought that as much as you becoming a Mormon? If you if you were decided to follow your dad's faith tradition? I think I think she would have felt that's a little bit more comfortable because it's like, well, how can I blame the kid? You know, he he wants to be part of his dad's religion. Okay. I mean, um, I think a lot of their reaction to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was they don't know a lot about it. It's just unknown, unfamiliar, okay. uncomfortable. Um, and, 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 you know, and there is a lot of demands that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints puts upon its members, right? It's a very active religion. Um so that's kind of scary, right? So I think, uh, yeah, I mean, but I would always counter with like, well, Martin Luther, I mean, he is, his teachings are absolutely supersessionist mm -hmm. and um, 
he also died an anti-Semite. Yep. The Jews. I mean, I, I'm just, yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just saying that as a scholar, like, um, and you know, Nazis recovered Martin Luther's teachings to try to, mm -hmm. you know, theologically and morally justify what they're doing. Right. And uh, there's a, there's a deeper problem in German Protestantism, right? German Protestantism doesn't have as much space for the Jews yeah. as uh, British Protestantism. Yeah. Um, that's, a, that's another scholar, you know, British Protestantism leads to Baptists, Presbyterians, uh, Methodists, yeah. and uh, I, I think the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. basically a, a form of, I mean, historically, so it's a form yeah. of, it's, it's a restoration, you know, if you believe it's a restoration, but the historical trajectory is it, it, it was born out of British Protestantism, sure. which always had a, a friendlier space for Jews. Uh, and that, I mean, and that's why, wh wh why does the Balfour Declaration come out of Great Britain? Because yeah. for whatever reason, I mean, that's a whole scholarly question, but the, the British just had a theologically, ethnically, socially, they were just more friendly to Jews. Yes. Well, and even the Disraeli was a Jewish prime minister in the 19th century in Israel. Yeah. He was he converted to the Church of and, England, but he was still Jewish. So the, the, the you know, yeah. it, it is, a, yeah, I, I think that's a great observation. Never thought of it that way. Yeah, I mean, it's a scholar, it's a scholarly one, but I mean, um, anyway, I think, so I, I'm very appreciative. I just, I think that, that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints actually has linkages, yeah. you know, to to all these forms of British, Protestantism, British, uh, you know, Anglo, mm -hmm. uh, uh, Christian Zionism. It's yeah. all, it's all connected. It's to, it, you know, and Joseph Smith is ethnically, he's, he's English, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, he, you know, it's just a couple centuries back his, his family's coming from the British Isles as, you know what I mean? It's the, it's not just the theology. It's, it's the heritage, right? There's a heritage component um and just you know Jews have had a better time in Britain and Britain and some people criticize Christian Zionism right and oh it's just trying to get the Jews over to Israel um for you know a nefarious purpose what i say to that is guess what having Jews alive in Israel is a lot better than Jews dead in crematoria so the telos of british protestantism is a heck of a lot better than the telos of German Protestantism. Okay. Well, that's that's you know. And then if that, you want, I'm, I'm putting it very bluntly. Yeah. You know, scholars could disagree with me, yeah, but let's let's just look at the history. Let's look that's what a, happened. It's fascinating. Yeah, that's very fascinating. Now, of course, I come from a Dutch tradition, uh, the yeah. Dutch Reformed tradition. Of course, the Netherlands historically was always very friendly to the Jews, probably more than yes. any people. And of course, the the Dutch Reformed tradition. We are the oldest. Uh, Protestant denomination in America is Reformed Church in America, and yeah. uh, my, my and and, uh, we, and uh, the other thing about the Dutch uh, Reformed is uh, people of covenant. They're very much about covenants. And then when yes. we talk about the Puritans, the Puritans they were people of covenant as well. So you can yeah. just kind of see how uh, Judaism, uh, it, it, yes, flourishes in America as well. And it yes, to Washington's letter in 1790, yeah. all these things that Judaism has found a place, a second Zion, if you will here in america and i absolutely. think yeah. absolutely absolutely and that's why i think that mormonism kind of complements this entire conversation in a way that people don't realize i think we yeah. both can kind of see the context of where it came out of i tell people i said mormons and evangelicals were, were cousins you you were birthed from our people in one sense i tell people yeah. so on april 6 1830 it was a room full of born again spirit-filled christians them's my people these were evangelicals that started from church that's <laughs> right this is the reality yeah. of the situation. This is the message I'm trying to get out there. And I think that when we can then also see the important role that Judaism has played um, in, in influencing us as well, and also how important that our friendliness towards Jews, the historical friendliness of the Reformed, of, of the uh, Church of England people towards Judaism yep. is a beautiful story that's undertold. And I think I'm, I'm glad you brought that out today. And and, and you're, you're right to correct me because, I mean, Calvin... Uh, himself had an expansive theology that had a place for Jews. Hmm. I mean, I think Calvin, I mean, the original debate was between Calvin and, and Luther, right? I mean, um, I mean that, and Calvin went on a direction that actually envisioned a, a future for Jews hmm. um, and put the possibility of a enduring covenant between God and the Jews. Yeah. Luther didn't, Luther didn't have any space for that. Yeah. 
Um, and so, and yeah, I think obviously the British reform tradition is, I think is connected. I mean, you, you may know more about that than I do, but I mean, you have Spinoza, the Netherlands, right. I well, mean, the new Am- Bible, which new, really new, cool. new York, New Amsterdam. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, there was, a, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I think the, the, I mean, the Netherlands invented kind of religious pluralism. Yep. Um, and then, so, I mean, they're the first to give space to Jews to just to live. Yep. Just to be alive. Cause guess what the alternative is, is. Yeah, exactly. Is, and, I mean, and, and there's the, yeah. So that's, that's beautiful. And I, yeah, it's, we needed to zoom out more and just kind yeah. of see how we're all connected as human beings and not, right. I mean, I'm not, you know, even though I'm doctrinally orthodox, I'm not, uh, I'm not as committed to like fighting to the nail for doctrinal orthodoxy. I'm, I'm far more interested in defending religious pluralism. If I'm going to, you know, if I'm going to fight for something. So, so, okay. So when you say orthodox, are we talking orthodox Mormon or orthodox Jew? Oh well, I mean, <laughs> uh, that's a well. I mean, I would, I kind of identify as uh, Orthodox Latter Day Saint, but uh, but very respectful of the conclusions of Orthodox Judaism. Um, I mean, it, yeah. I mean, I still view Judaism as having its own integrity in and of itself. Yeah, I agree with I that. Mean, so, I mean, so. I mean, I, yeah. So, I mean, that's why I'm not, uh, I'm not trying to do proselytizing amongst Jews. I I see, because I mean, even as we've already talked about in the story, I mean, Rabbi Raphael, the, the Sinai covenant is still valid. So if, if a Jewish person is going to say, hey, I'm going to remain loyal to the revelation and covenant received at Mount Sinai, I honor that. Um, I look at, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is kind of this concept I've been working through is like a, a Camorra covenant, right? Uh, okay. if you, yeah, you know. Sinai covenant and Camorra covenant. Yep. Yeah, you've got this hill and it's yep. a hill, but it's not a mount. But uh, you've got, you know, a tablets uh, that, you know, uh, that are deposited in the hill and yep. the tablets kind of uh, bring a new a new covenant. Um, I'm OK with the idea that God could uh, dispense of, of uh, multiple covenants with, with peoples. I'm not going to limit God to, to only one covenant at a time. Um, uh, uh, one thing so. I wanted to ask, ask you is <clears throat> I wanna, I, I, one more thing I want to talk about that's in the book. And then I want to actually have you talk about your co-author, James Goldberg. Is yeah. um, I did hint at it early on. So I feel it's important that I do bring this up is that <clears throat> you, you did, um, engage during your mission because you served your mission in new jersey and you for a while yeah. there you were kind of welcomed into the homes of messianic jews or messianic yeah. Christians, however you want to call yeah. them. and then you actually thought you were you were having good relations good conversations but then something happened that kind of showed you uh the reality of the situation maybe just talk a little bit about that story yeah yeah so we we were in um in new york uh rockland county new york i think the the most concentrated county of jewish people in the United States. <laughs> um, and there were a couple messianic synagogues, uh, Jew, you know, um, and just to explain the audience, the messianic would be what that Mitch guy was doing. was a Jewish yes. convert to Christianity who believes that Jesus is the, is the Messiah. Yeshua is the Messiah. That is what they would, that's what they believe. But right. there, there, but there are temples. They go through all, they all do the same rites and rituals that you would find in many Jewish temples. Would that be a fair, uh, uh, definition? Yes. There? Okay. So maybe explain yeah. that. Now that we know that, explain the, what happened there. So I was really curious to go and worship with them and because I had actually never seen this kind of synthesis of Judaism and Christianity. And I was, I mean, obviously I'm going to be very curious to learn from them and see what they do, see if they connect with the Book of Mormon the way that I did, um, you know, try it out, learn from them. Maybe they learn a little from me. And, um, and we go to like the Shabbat services, you know, and, and my com- missionary companions were pretty curious as well. So we got, yeah, I mean, some of them were just really friendly and just, you know, we'd go to their home and, um, you know, and I just hear their, just how they're synthesizing this faith in Jesus and the Jewish identity. And, um, cause I'm trying to figure it out myself 
right? Um, and I don't have any, I didn't have any answers at that point. Um, and so, you know, some of them were just because of trust, they were just interested to see if they could learn more about the Book of Mormon because they were impressed that the Book of Mormon brought me to, like you said, a confession of, of faith in Jesus Christ. So Yeshua HaMashiach or, you know, mm-hmm. same, same, same guy. Um, and so they're okay. What, what's, what's, what is in this book that could inspire this kind of con- faith confession? So they're curious and, you know, we have plenty of free books of Mormon. So, we're, you know, we're giving them to some of these families and, uh, and the, the head rabbi pastor, um, I think, I think he went by rabbi, right. They still could call themselves rabbis. Um, and it's America, you know, you self-define. So I'm not going to get into, you know, is this Jewish? Is it Christian? doesn't matter. It's America. You, you right. self-define call yourself anything you want. You self-define. Um, so he pulled me aside and my companion after like the Shabbat, the Friday night Sabbath service. And he took us into his car and he said, um, he said, Jason, I'm, you know, I'm really, uh, you know, I know your background and, you know, I don't want to, you know, to cut you off, uh, from, from our, you know, from our congregation, it was very complicated discussion, right? Because, um, but I, I mean, obviously, I'm a very uh, outward, you know, Latter Day Saint missionary. So, um, but he, he's like, I've got reports that you're going into our members' homes, my members' homes, and talking to them about the Church of Jesus Christ Latter Day Saints, the Book of Mormon. He said, I, I need you to stop. Um, and he was very firm and very like just angry, like, like Mm. gritty, like if you don't stop, like, you know, something bad's going to (laughs) happen. And it's very, I mean, we're like in the car and I mean, you know, he's obviously, but I I mean, I'm definitely feeling some like violent impulses inside of him that are really concerning, but I mean, I also want to be respectful. So, and he's kind of like, well, if you want to talk about messianic judaism you talk to me and me only like you don't talk to my 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 members right um but he you know but it was so hostile that like i i didn't want to talk to him anymore (laughs) you know um and uh you know and and i mean after that we were respectful and we just you know we just stayed we just didn't visit those people um and uh you know we just moved on to you know we had oh. we had thousands of other people to to teach but it it was a, a kind of traumatic experience well and the, re- the reason i wanted you to tell that story is that because evangelicals pour millions of dollars into these messianic jews for jesus and these messianic congregations that this is really funded by american evangelical christianity are the main financiers of this of this as a type of an evangelization and robot rabbi tove uh, uh, it exposes many of them, if it talks about many of them and their tactics that they use that I do think at times are unethical. And then it did, it, it hurt me to hear that guy, the rabbi, say those things to you um, when you can contrast that to your rabbis, where you said earlier, we could talk about anything. And, and it yeah. was an open setting. And I think that's tr- more true Judaism than what, what you saw in that car that day. And that's, yeah. you know, and uh, so, yeah, yeah. well, um, okay, so I wanted to ask you about, you have uh, this, first of all, this is, folks, This I, there's going to be a link in the description. This is by the by Common Sense Consent Press, okay? And uh, I'm going to put a link in here. I want you to buy this book. It's a, it's very well written. I think part of the reason, first of all, it's a great story, but I also think you had, this is kind of unusual because James Goldberg's voice is not heard. It's your voice, but he's the author. Maybe just talk a little bit about James and the process of having a, a co-writer write kind of an autobiography and how much did he help you and what, what was that process? Yeah. Like? No, thank you, Stephen. So yeah, briefly, J- James and I go really far back. We, uh, we, we worked on the Joseph Smith papers together when I was an undergraduate and he was a, a graduate student, a master's, master's of uh, fine arts, creative writing. And so he obviously his last name is Goldberg. Yeah, there he is. 
uh, he he looks he looks more Jewish than I do, and he's got the the Jewish last name. But but uh, <laughs> the story is mine. <laughs> and um, uh, James is just a lovely human being. When we worked on the Joseph Smith papers, we really bonded. He has Jewish um, ancestry through his father's side of the family, where he gets Goldberg. But we were always interested in these Jewish Mormon questions, even, you know, 15 years ago. And uh, anyway, the time came to write the story. And there's I could talk about that if you're interested. But about James is um, when the time came to, to write the story and I had decided I, I need to get this book into the world um, because it's a complex story. And... Um, and I need to tell it honestly, and I I don't want anybody else to tell my story for me. <laughs> and I I was worried about becoming a like a poster child for uh, Jewish conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints or something like that. When it, it it's it's so much more complicated than than just that. Um, um, I I you know. I have a testimony of the Book of Mormon and Jesus Christ, but I'm not going around, you know, becoming a, a, a Jews a Jews for Mormon or, or I mean, a Jews for Jesus, you know, through Mormon or something. Right. I don't know. Um, I'm not. I'm not that kind of. Uh, I I kind of more define myself as a prophetic Jew, mm -hmm. um, more than a a messianic Jew. Okay. Um, and I've always been that way. Right. So uh, even the it, it is that, you know, we'll, we'll be on YouTube here, but it is thanks to Rabbi Tovia Singer that I even started thinking about the Messiah. Uh, mm, mm, mm. Before then, I heard about the Messiah. I heard about Jesus, but I wasn't that interested in the Messiah as a topic. I was very interested in prophets. I was interested in Moses. I was interested in Isaiah, you know, Isaiah. I was into the Haftarah. I was interested in covenant commandments. But I mean, the end of times, the Messiah, you know, the. I wasn't even thinking about that. Um, so, I mean, I mean, that's it's very clear, right? Uh, it just those questions were not pertinent. So in any case, James, uh, I wanted to write something beautiful. So my goal was, I want a beautiful book that is uh, that is art. Um, I don't I don't want to write a missionary tract. Um, I've I've had a lot of you know complexities in life with that. Uh, and not that, obviously, I support. Our missionaries, I support the freedom of religion of other missionaries too. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying that, but for my story, I wanted it to, to just tell the story of a human being, you know. And um, and James is a novelist. He's a poet. Um, he writes fiction. He writes nonfiction. He he's su such a culturally astute and spiritually wise person. Um, just a beautiful human being himself. And very, very much an artist. It's his identity, right? I'm not an artist. I guess like I've produced a little art, right? But I'm not like it's not like who I am, like right. I'm a military officer, you know. Like I'm a scholar, but I'm not really like an artist. So I'm like I need an artist because this, um, and and James is just the one that came to mind because because we were already close and um and he's very very sensitive and knowledgeable about Jewish issues. He's written about, he has a book, The Five Books of Jesus, uh, which won a, a lot of awards, and it's kind of uh, fiction. It's it's basically gospels, the four gospel, the uh, fiction, hmm. gospel fiction, oh, um, based, on, based on the four gospels. And so, um, yeah, and, and so that was yeah. it. And so we- So you have a that was beautiful it. story to tell, and you had a beautiful writer help write it. Uh, yeah, beautifully written, beautiful story. The Burning Book is a fantastic book. Uh, again, there will be links in the description. Um, 
I guess, hey, this is the thing. Like, uh, we didn't even get to so much. As a matter of fact, when I was going through these interviews, like, I thought we were going to cover a lot more, in, you know, uh, chronologically. But I thought uh, our riffing, by the way, our conversation about the Book of Mormon and that Messiah and the Messiah, and then, oh my goodness, like, I'm I, I'm going to have to integrate that into my Protestant defense of the Book of Mormon talk that, that I've, that I've. Oh, thank you. Because I think there's some good stuff there um, that I could use. Thank you. Um, this was a great conversation, dude. And yeah, just folks, you know, he was he served as a as a, a Navy chaplain, a LDS Navy chaplain until very recently. But you're now in a different uh, uh, department, if you will, of uh, within the Navy. I don't know how much you want to talk about that, but you are an officer. What's your office? What's your ranking in the Navy, by the way? Uh, Lieutenant commander. Lieutenant commander. And you're in the U.S. Yep. Navy. And you are now just recently relocated. To Pearl Harbor, yeah. Florida. <laughs> why? Why? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I said Florida. <laughs> so very similar. So, so you just got settled in there, and you say it's just absolutely beautiful every time you walk outside. I'm I'm yeah. really happy. It seems like you're in a good place in your life. You got a wonderful wife. You talk about her meeting her in the book, and you yeah. got a wonderful family. It just sounds like you're living the life, dude. Thank you, thank you. I I I'm very grateful for all my blessings and that's pretty much it. I just, just uh, basically want to live to bless other people, yeah. help them help other people get some blessings. How are we doing and, here for time? You got a couple more minutes? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm okay. I'm doing so okay. I, I'm okay. So my mom reminded me, first of all, first, first of all, speaking of my mom, my mom found this at the local Christian thrift store for a dollar. <laughs> Salt Lake bees, the t-shirt that I'm wearing nice. so for that for the, this is the debut of this shirt uh, here on Mormon book reviews. Now, I had this thing. I haven't done it for a while. My mom actually reminded me. And you may not even know because I don't know how much of my stuff you watch. But every once in a while when I have an LDS guest on, I ask them the three questions. And I said, these are the three questions that I want every evangelical who is interested in having dialogue with a uh, with a believer in the Book of Mormon or a Latter-day Saint. And I, I want you to ask them these three questions if you really want to get a real good conversation rather than these these poor Christians coming in. It's like, oh, God makers and Jesus and, bro- and, and, and Satan are brothers and all this nonsense that these these poor Christians are being exposed to. Um, I want evangelicals to ask these three questions. So here I am going to ask the three questions. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Question number one, what is your favorite Book of Mormon story? Ah, well... My favorite Book of Mormon story, I think my my favorite one is actually uh, Abinadi, okay. when he uh, uh, he he uh, confronts um, the king, and uh, you know calls uh, calls the king to uh, to repentance, and uh, is willing to to risk uh, death by fire, which which actually happens to him. Um, but what I love about the Abinadi story the most is it is the he is acting as the quintessential like Hebrew prophet. I mean, he's you know, he's going in um with with a, a revelatory message and he's unafraid uh of the consequences. And uh it's based on a message of repentance, uh returning. You know, returning to uh, covenantal obedience, faithfulness to God, and um, and he you know, he makes prophecies about what's going to happen to this kingdom in the future, uh, and and you know the seeds that he plants are so powerful. You know, there's Alma, and Alma goes mm-hmm. and and basically starts a church, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, so his testimony is not for for nothing. So. Um, and even yeah, though he it, never gets to see any of this, he doesn't know he's he, he he's burned alive. But the 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 fruits that came out of his ministry is Alma and his church. So it's, right, it's, it's where, where a lot of people come come to God, right? So yeah, yeah okay. I mean, you know, yeah, it's uh, it just I, that's always resonated with me. Okay. Um, All right, you ready for question number two? Yeah. What is your favorite Bible story? Ah, favorite Bible story. I I think um I I actually think I mean it's 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 in the Torah. Um I I I would say that my favorite Bible story is really uh the story of uh, of manna um in in the five books of Moses. Um I 
I mean, I, I am like a, a biblical literalist, so I, I do believe it happened. Okay. Um, but what I what I love about the story is that the uh, what I love most about it is that the manna, God gave the manna once a day, uh, you know, two portions on uh, before the Sabbath, but um, it only had a shelf life that lasted for a day. Yep. So if you try to stock it up, uh, it'll go stale and you can't eat it. And so it, it, it was this kind of this discipline of God teaching the Israelites to depend on him literally every day, you know, and, you know, it's beautiful. And Jesus says, give us this day, our daily bread. I mean, literally there's uh, there's a connection to, to the manna experience uh, experientially going through life of having to depend on God each day for your daily bread. You can't stock it up. You, you've got to just have faith and come out mm. tomorrow morning and, and get your daily bread from God. And I've applied that a lot in spiritually that, you know, we, we have to be immersed in daily scripture study, daily prayer, or, you know, our spirits will we're spiritually atrophy. Mm -hmm. And, and that's uh, just always been a lesson to me that, and, you know, and I like, I like it cause it's, it's not the law. Oh my goodness. Right. The law is so bad. And it's like something very, uh delicious spiritually you know that you can get from the torah so you kind of alluded to it in a sense <laughs> in, in the second question that, in your answer but the third question i have for you is who is jesus to you yeah that's a great question um so jesus i would say number one that comes to mind is is he's he's my master um and in this you know in the sense of rabbi right my master um but i i, I really look at my relationship with him as uh as one of of service to him and um that 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 he knows the way um i mean related to him as master is is shepherd uh i i really feel very connected to Jesus as shepherd um, and my, I guess, identity as, as a lamb or as an under shepherd, sometimes depending on the, the situation. Um, but that, uh, that he does know the way to, to feed us uh, spiritually. Um, he knows the way to lead us to the still waters and the green grass um, that, that really, uh, the spiritual food, uh, that we need, um, ultimately for our eternal peace, our eternal salvation, um, eternal life. Uh, I mean, that's ultimately, he's a shepherd that leads us back into the garden of Eden. Um, and that, you know, so he's, he's the one that I, I trust to, to take me there. And I, I believe that I know his voice pretty well. Um, I don't always follow his voice, but I know the shepherd's voice and I'm, I'm grateful for that. Mm. The, the, according to Mormon theology, the atonement uh, began in a garden and ultimately we all want to end up back in that garden, back in yeah. the paradise, And that's what it's all about. And we will be led by our shepherd there. So, well, my yeah. friend, I want to thank you for this wonderful conversation we had today. Thank you, Stephen. That was, it was wonderful. And I just want to remind you all, don't forget to get the, check out the book. Uh, is, it an, is it in an audio edition as well, by chance? Yeah. So, okay. Audible. So it's, it's, okay. Yeah. So you can get on Audible as well, folks. So keep that in mind. I uh, just want to remind all of you, for those of you who would like to financially support the program, there are links in the description to help us on PayPal, Venmo, as well as on Patreon. And I want to thank all of you who, who are participating. Also remind you, mormonbookreviews.com is our merch store. We have hot chocolate mugs. We have ball caps, all sorts of merchandise where you can support us there as well. And I just remember the most important thing, folks, is just remember, all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews. <laughs>